If you know a little, you have enough to believe. So believe and see. Jesus proved who he was time and time again, and yet he always seemed to run into people that had little faith. It's, well, you know, when we have a little bit of faith and we have a little bit of knowledge that can allow us to continue on to believe, see with our eyes, make a decision to look into this matter of faith more, and then we realize then we'll see Jesus for really who he is. What I find interesting is that there's a lot of people that know the name of Jesus. So when we talk about evangelism in our particular culture here, yes, we will do so. There are a subset of people that don't know about Jesus at all, maybe just the name. And there are people that are growing up that have never grown up in faith, so they don't know anything about faith. And uh, yet there's others out there that know quite a bit of the Bible, but still don't have faith. And But much of that is much evangelism that can happen today, which means to share the good news of the kingdom, is to let people know about the good news of Jesus Christ, that he has come to forgive us, and he's come to empower us, and he's come to rejoice over our saved lives. And so as he does that, one of the things that we need to do as we go out and do the same thing is to clear up misconceptions. Uh, and the average Christian, if they could just kind of get a grasp on more of the Bible and more of Jesus' teachings and what it means and what it represents, then we will be able to, in casual conversation with people, whenever it comes up, because faith often does come up, you don't need to beat people over the head with the Bible, and uh, we just bring up if there's a misconception that happens, then you'll be equipped to be able to say, well, you know what, you really should be looking at it like this and not that. And this, these are the verses to which, you know, I lean on to be able to look at it this way. And you just might end up being someone who brings the good news to someone else. So here we are today in Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 to 34. And here we are talking about uh, John the Baptist's disciples coming and asking questions about Jesus. And uh, the, the miracles that follow are, are all connected. So that's why we're taking these 20 verses today. is because this really does all go together. It really does help us to understand uh, what's going on. So why don't we read the first three verses so we get the context of what this is all about. So here we are, chapter uh, 9, verses 14, as we continue on our series on discipleship through the book of Matthew. Then John's disciples came and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, and the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour the new wine in the new wineskins, and both are preserved. So this is shortly after Jesus arrived back in Capernaum. He calls Matthew, he heals a paralytic, uh, and uh, forgives sins. And then, so this brings, John's disciples are now following Jesus, and they come and they ask him. And it's what, something to note is that, why are John's disciples not with him? Well, it could be quite um, literal that Herod Antipas, the region to which they were in, that John the Baptist was already imprisoned by this point. So we know that John the Baptist was imprisoned early on in Jesus' ministry, but we don't know exactly when. Sometimes it, it, Luke seems to indicate before, but the way that the wordage happens, sometimes they talk about things as in past tense and not necessarily in a particular order. So we don't know for sure if John the Baptist is in prison, but it does seem likely at this point. We already know that John the Baptist had sent disciples to Jesus at another point, which we'll get to that uh, later, asking, hey, are you the one that was prophesied or should we expect something, someone different? And I'll be getting to the miracles that are, you're about to see here in just a moment. So John the Baptist obviously uh, came in the spirit of Elijah to come and prepare the way of the Lord. So that came with a call of repentance. Remember, repentance is part of the kingdom call. Jesus came, uh, and as he said, the kingdom of heaven is near, and he says, repent, and then uh, he came to cast out demons and to heal people. So this is what he was saying, is because the kingdom is coming, turn from your ways and follow my ways. That's what repent means. And then heal people. I think the kingdom was going to come and heal. It was going to set spiritual oppression uh, free in people. And then also to let people have physical freedom in their bodies. And so with, uh, at this point in time, people fasting and praying, it was a big part of the Jewish life. And especially thinking that the disciples thinking that John the Baptist was the Elijah, you know, maybe a little bit of extra prayer and gusto uh, would be required at this particular point. So Jesus responds by uh, talking about himself as a bridegroom. And then he talks about uh, cloth, and then he talks about wineskins. Three examples that he's giving here to tell them that he is indeed the Messiah. The first is he says, well, do people fast with those who are rejoicing? 
Well, one of the biggest merrymaking moments in the ancient Mideast would have been at weddings. Whole towns would have come to rejoice, you know, the, the human race continuing on, because that's what marriage symbolized, two becoming one and then having children. And we're told throughout scripture that children are an inheritance from the Lord. So for us to be able to kind of keep on going, it is something to rejoice over. And so Jesus is saying here that he calls himself the bridegroom, which by the way, in the Old Testament, uh, it's referred to twice as referring to Yahweh. And so he's telling these d disciples of John saying, uh, if the bridegroom is here, so seeing the work of Elijah is now complete, I've arrived. That would have changed, that would have been quite a mindset for them to change because they have been preparing and preparing. And then all of a sudden, here's the bridegroom right in front of them. And he says, the bridegroom's here and you're, we're going to rejoice. There'll be a time later when the bridegroom will be taken away and then there will be some mourning and fasting. And so with this, he teaches quite stunningly clearly that the era of the Elijah is now over. He has done his job and now it is time for people to recognize the Messiah for who he is. And so this is no mere introduction of Jesus, of declaring himself. He's already declared himself quite a few times through what he has done. An astute student would have already realized that this guy is the, the Son of God who has come, the Messiah who's come to save us. And, but yet people had enough knowledge, they started to follow, but that different times people believed. Also, Jesus is not just telling them that he's the Messiah. He's telling them what the Messiah had come to do. All throughout the Old Testament was prophesied that God himself would save his people and that it would be a time of great rejoicing. Matthew 25 uh, talks, we'll get into that when we get there in this series, but talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb and talks about what God uh, has in store for us. And what it is is that he just longs to save his people so that he can be our God and that he can rejoice with us forever. You were made to rejoice. You were made to have a deep-seated joy within your heart. That's one of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Say that ten times fast. But joy is supposed to be a huge part of our lives, and rejoicing is what we're going to be doing for all eternity. And, and so not only is he introducing himself, saying, I am the Messiah, but I've also come here to rejoice. Now is the time to rejoice. So this is something we need to, to really realize, is what are the things that we allow to steal our joy? When the Apostle Paul was talking to the Galatians, they'd kind of turned into a legalism to try to approach God again instead of through the Spirit. And so as that happened, he says, who, who stole your joy? Who tripped you up? And I'd really like to encourage you with that too, is what are the things in this world that trip you up, that take your eyes off of Christ and steal your joy? You should be marked as a person of joy. Again, never finger wagging to make someone feel bad for the times they've not allowed the Lord to put a joy on our hearts, but to help us to inspire us to realize that like, yes, we are supposed to live a rejoicing lives. And it should be a big part of who we are, even when things bad happen to us, that we can rejoice because this all means nothing. In the big scheme of things, when we get to heaven, it will all be fixed. Every tear wiped from our eye. We'll see our God and we'll know that everything that we have done here on the earth for the Lord was worth it. And then so this rejoicing, by the way, Jesus goes on into talking about uh, two other analogies of that were household norms of sewing patches on clothing and wine and wineskins. And he goes on to say that he is the new wine and the rejoicing, this, this kingdom that has come near is the new wine. And things are going to be done differently. We're going to be doing things with joy in our hearts. With When the difficulty comes, we won't let that steal uh, the joy that God has given us away. So joy and the new wine are considered together here. And it's what the, the purpose of Christ bringing the kingdom to the earth was to do. So I'd really love to encourage you on that, that this is what the new wine is. Jesus is doing something new. And instead of having people mourn and be trapped in our sins, that we're now going to be free free from the schemes of the enemy. We're going to be free that we pray for our own physical healing, that that's available to us today, and that we're going to be free from the trials that happen in our lives trying to get us down, that we're going to be free to just have our hearts be elated to know that we're going to be with God forever. And, and so with that, this is what that new wine encompasses, is that, you know what, the old covenant, uh, Jesus came to fulfill it. Now, Jesus said, not one stroke of the law I'm going to get rid of. He said, but I am going to fulfill it. And that he did. That's why we don't sacrifice animals at a temple anymore. This is why the New Testament, the, the church, the people are the temple that house the Holy Spirit within us. So things are going to be done differently. It's not going to be that only at the temple in Jerusalem, which has been destroyed for quite some time, that God's going to work there. So God's going to do new things and in an appropriate way. So in the same way that he says it's appropriate to put new wine into new wineskins because they stretch and they work with each other as the pressure of fermenting begins. If you put new wine into an old wineskin, it has already expanded as much as it's going to. So with the added pressure, it's going to burst. 
and ruin the whole thing. So his whole point is saying, if we're trying to have like uh, old ways of dealing with God and, uh, and putting his new wine into it, it's, it's, it's just not going to work. This is why we don't really need to follow the feasts. It's good to mark them out and to know what they were for and what these Old Testament feasts entailed. But some people try to insist saying, he didn't get rid of the feast. I'm like, well, he, he got rid of the mandatory uh, part of needing to follow them because Jesus is the fulfillment of all those feasts. We even learn that Jesus is our Sabbath day's rest, according to Colossians chapter 2. And so though you can observe a Sabbath and though you should get rest, it's not a law that's hard and rigid. So if we're going to try to approach God through a very legal, legalistic frame, you know, we're not going to understand the freedom that comes from just loving the Lord and having him write his laws on our hearts. And that's ultimately what he wants us to do is get out of this legal contract that these guys were stuck in and just obeying for this reason or that reason. But so that we actually have a relationship with our Lord and that we want to do the things that he wants us to do. And we don't want to do the things he doesn't want us to do. This is the new wine. This is the new way that he's doing it. And this is the new the vessels to which he is uh, giving us is that he just wants to be with us, to be our God. So Jesus came to free us from legalism, just this kind of blind adherence to a faith that it doesn't really affect the heart. So whereas Jesus continually, up to this point, he ran into people who were doing everything external with their faith and not internal. And he's going, that's not the vessel I'm going to use. I need to flip that. That doesn't mean that the outward is not important, but it means he wants to start with the inward, work on our heart, and then it will just come through naturally in our works and deeds. And remember, these guys were praying and fasting on schedules that were legalistic, and they thought that by doing that, that somehow gained them favor with the Lord. But Jesus said, there's still a way for sin to hide in your heart by doing all the, the laws, uh, and, but not allowing your heart to be rendered. So Jesus was coming for the heart of the human being and to transform our lives from the inside out, not the outside in, as he had continuously run into up to this point. So just by a little sidebar, the whole idea of the new wine into new wineskins, that uh, has often been uh, left out of most preaching because a lot of people just don't even bother preaching on it. But those that seem to do so in this culture uh, try to talk about it that the Holy Spirit's going to do something interesting and new in our generation. To somehow that new wineskins are like, you know what, well the Holy Spirit's continuing to break people out of legalism. Of course, that's a continuation of the new wine. But there's not going to be another new wineskin for the year 2024, as some of these so-called prophets out there are saying about that God's going to do a new thing and it's a new act of the Holy Spirit in our age. No, he made the new wine and put it in a new wineskin and that wine still lasts for us today. It's to get out of legalism and they let our hearts be rendered after the Lord and that we just desire to want to do what he wants. And, and if that's the case, then if that's the new wine that was established then, and it's still good for us here today. So right after this teaching, Jesus goes on to heal a bunch of different people uh, in a quick succession, in a, quite a way that was um, very prophetic. So he's not just now announced that he's the bridegroom and why he's come and what he's coming to do. He's now coming to demonstrate it. And he does it in such a flurry that has never been seen in the entire Old Testament. So the people are blown away that you're going to see this when I read it is they're blown away because even when healings were done, uh, like uh, the 10 plagues of Egypt, well, that was just a one-off event. Yes, there was miracles through the bread every day uh, and the manna in the wilderness. And then Elijah raised a couple people from the dead and did a few miracles. So did Elisha the prophet. But there's not, as a time scale goes, there's really not a lot. And then when you look at all the amount that Jesus did in a matter of months, it is absolutely ridiculous. And people would be like, we have never, ever seen anything like this. And further, you would note that anybody who did a miracle or a healing in the Old Testament often invoked the name of God first. In the name of God, I declare this. Jesus doesn't do that. He just simply does it on his own authority again, saying that he is the bridegroom. He is Yahweh. He is the Father in the flesh. He is the Son of God. He has come here to set us free, and he's demonstrating it to a thick-headed people. <laughs> So why don't we read the rest of these verses, and then we'll see how the, what we can learn from that. While he was saying this, a synagogue leader came to him and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hands on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went to him, and so did his disciples. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, If only I touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that moment. When Jesus entered the synagogue, the leader's house, and he saw the noisy crowds of the people and the pipes playing, he said, Go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. 
and the crowd had been put outside, and he went and he took the girl by the hand, and she got up. News of this spread through the whole region. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind man came to him, and he asked him, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and he said, According to your faith, let it be done to you. And their sight was restored. Jesus warned them sternly, See to it that nobody knows about this. But they went out and they spread the news about him all over that region. While they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed and said, Nothing like this has ever happened seen in Israel. But the Pharisee said, It is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. So Matthew here gives us a quick rendition of Jairus, the synagogue leader's daughter. And he just kind of does it in bullet form. Matthew is just kind of like talking more about the event and as it points to Jesus, not necessarily all the details. Luke goes on to a little bit more details of saying that, well, at first when Jairus went, first identified him as Jairus, and then said that the daughter was gravely ill, and that when they were walking, but not dead yet, but on the way back to the house, they were met by some people and said, don't bother the teacher anymore, she died. And then it says at that point, is just, it doesn't say it, but implies it. Jesus looks at the man as if he's like just stunned. He just heard your daughter died. How could you not be? And he says, don't doubt, just believe. And they kept on going. What I find interesting about that is many of these here was according to your faith, they've been healed. And uh, is what Jesus said to the woman um, who was bleeding and, uh, and the blind men as well. But for this one here, Jairus... And it seems his whole family had lost faith. They didn't believe that Jesus could do it. Maybe something glimmered inside his heart when Jesus said those words, don't doubt, just believe. And then they continued on. It was customary to wail and to whine and to play flutes and uh, a big mourning spectacle. In fact, it was quite encouraged in the ancient Middle East to be very emotive very immediately to express oneself. And uh, the Greeks didn't quite like that because they thought they were kind of revealing all of their thoughts and emotions. Uh, to the world, and they thought it might be wise to keep some of those secret. Strangely enough, that's why we often say, you know, let's guard our hearts in front of others. So it's amazing to see that how much uh, culture has changed over the years and how much of even the Greek influence of kind of having that stiff upper lip and keeping your emotions to yourself uh, has changed in our generation. I'm not suggesting you go fly off the handle and be super emotive because uh, you probably misunderstood in this culture. But nonetheless, here that was a normal for them to go from crying and wailing to laughing at Jesus, at the absurdity to say that she's just asleep. Like, they know what a dead body is, and they knew that she was dead. But Jesus is giving another point here, too, is that he's saying, no, 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 no. This life is only temporary. There will be an awakening. Everyone will rise from their graves. She's not dead. She's just asleep. No one is truly dead. We will all be raised to life, and we'll be sent to one of two places. I pray that you have the faith to follow Christ to heaven. So a couple things that are interesting here too. It was not uh, to considered unclean to touch a person that had was blind. That was just considered a disability. It was, however, an unclean thing to touch uh, a female while she was on her menstrual cycle. In this case, the, the words used and used elsewhere in scripture and in Greek medical texts to say this particular issue was indeed one uh, of the reproductive organs, which would have rendered her unclean which is likely why she, that type of bleeding, instead of hemophilia, which by the way only usually just affects men uh, most of the time, but the, why she knew, knowing that she was unclean, knowing that as Luke had said, spent all her money trying to find a cure from somewhere else and couldn't, that helpless she goes, I'll just touch the, the hem of his cloak. She wanted to be anonymous. She didn't want to be called out because she was unclean. She shouldn't have even been in a crowd according to the Old Testament law. But her faith was like, you know, she risked, risked a stoning, to be honest. And for an unclean person to be out, they would consider them an infectious person. And so because of that, a threat to society. And, uh, and so uh, she just goes quietly and touches them. And Luke brings more detail because Jesus says th there in Luke, wait, someone touched me. And the disciples are like, you got to be kidding me. We're in a crowd. Everybody's touching you. And he goes, no, no, no. I felt power leave me. And, uh, and so he turned around and he stopped the whole parade what was going on. His disciples are like, come on, Jesus, everybody's like, we're crowding, it's crushing you. Of course someone touched you. And when she found out that she was being stared at by Jesus and knew that she couldn't hide it any longer, she told him. And then he says, your faith has healed you. 
And, uh, and then next we move on to the unclean spirits. It says those uh, had, had muted the man. Now there are some external forces to which that would seem to apply, uh, like we learned about last week, was you could have super violent strength, you could be violent if the demon possessed. Here it's a manifestation of being mute. We learn other places to which violence and destruction and really just poor quality of life in general is what evil spirits do when they're in and around us. Which is why we should seek spiritual discernment when we know that we're facing some really odd, you know, the, you know how there's normal things that kind of go wrong? If you ever see something you're like, man, there's a little bit more to it than that. This just seems a little too weird. Well, and you don't always know because um, I don't know too many exorcists, but I do know that I can pray and the Lord will immediately come to my rescue. Satan will flee. And that's our instruction in scripture is draw near to the Lord and Satan will flee. So I'm not trying to give you some instructions here that Jesus is casting out this demon, that you should go find anybody who's mute or anybody who is violent and go cast out a demon. I would encourage you to draw near to the Lord and just see what the Lord will do himself. It is him that does the rebuking, not us. So all of these things that Jesus had done, he touched a dead body, which was unclean. He touched a, a bleeding woman who was unclean and dealt with an unclean spirit. This is also something that Jesus was prophesied to do, the Messiah was prophesied to do, was to cleanse the people of their sins. And so by him coming and not only just healing people, he's healing them in ways that were messianic, by the way, the healing of the blind and the mute uh, and the deaf, by the way, were all messianic signs that we will see pop up on the screen here, these references for you. And, and so John the Baptist sends his disciples back later and ask, is it the one? Are you the one? Or should we expect it to come? And then Jesus cites this miracle. He says, the deaf hear, the mute speak, the blind see. And he said, take that back to him. And he was just telling even John the Baptist, you should know just by this. If you don't believe me for what I say, believe me for the works. Because even Jesus, with his, the way, his new way of doing things, was even a bit foreign to his cousin, John the Baptist. And he didn't quite understand, why hasn't he created the revolution yet? He's very famous. He's very popular. He's doing miracles, I hear. Why am I still in prison? And why aren't we in Jerusalem ruling? And why isn't he sitting on David's throne? Again, these uh, blind men, they recognize this is the son of David. And they shout out, son of David, have mercy on me. That was not a word or phrase that was given out lightly. It was one reference to in 2 Samuel 7 verse 12 as the promise to David that if he was faithful, then his descendants would rule forever and that he would put, the, the Messiah would come through that genealogy. And so by Jesus doing the healing of these two blind men, showing that what they could see in the spirit but couldn't see in reality, they now get to see in, in, in with their own eyes. How cool is that? That they were able to perceive. They were able to believe and perceive that uh, the Messiah had come. They called it out and then they got to see him with their own eyes and not just in the spirit. And so again, as Jesus is going, each and every one of these, this is showing that he's like uh, some of the Old Testament prophets, but better and doing more. And this flurry of activity has the people saying, we've never seen it. This has got to be it. At a heightened time, this is why we learned earlier that, you know, they were ready to make Jesus king by force at this point. And Jesus had to escape from them to stop them from doing that. And, uh, and so here then we have the Pharisees who aren't liking him being called the son of David. Oh, they would have been really happy for a prophet to show up. They were eagerly awaiting the Messiah, but they were, again, new wine in an old wineskin. They just weren't ready to receive what Jesus was doing and doing it differently. They're ready to see even Elijah-type figure. They could probably say, yeah, I can handle a prophet who's weird, who doesn't do things our way. I'm like, but you're calling this the Messiah? No way. And if John the Baptist thought he should have been sprung from prison and they should be ruling in Jerusalem, how much more anybody else that wouldn't be that close to Jesus? And that was the big thing is Jesus came to set us free from our sin because he saw that as far more important than freeing us from uh, the difficulties we face today. He will rescue us from all of that, but he has a time to which he has said, this is the time for the kingdom to be preached, to tell people to repent, and that we go out there and we pray for healing and restoration. And all the while, we go rejoicing. And so with this, just as we conclude, we can see that Jesus has put so much out there that we have uh, rendered throughout history and through the scriptures for us to have know this is reliable text, that this is the word of God taught to us, that Jesus is God in the flesh who came down. And we cannot underestimate how important that is because God made the world perfect. Humans messed it up big time. And he's offered to fix it through his son, that God himself will come and save us from the own mess that we have made. He asks us to be patient for a time until everybody has a chance to hear that gospel message. So that's why we remain. 
And it's why in the very next verse of all this being laid down by Jesus, he says, the workers are few. Pray to the Lord, therefore, to send workers out into the field. If we want to see heaven come soon, we need to be a part of God's ministry, praying for God to bring more ministers into the kingdom and that the gospel goes out from us. We have an incredible opportunity like no other generation has had. There's scarcely been more than a quarter of a million people throughout much of human history and only upwards of a billion in the last like 500 years. The fact that we have 8 billion souls on this planet that we get to share the gospel with all around the world, even just through a camera from here in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, uh, it presents such a wonderful opportunity that we are alive in this moment to be able to see this gospel has gotten to us, can be translated with artificial intelligence and computer programs like that to go all around the world with people who don't own much but have a smartphone. And so let's pray that this work will go into the harvest field and that people will get to know about Jesus Christ, put their faith in him, and see the love and peace and the rejoicing that comes along with it. And for this, this is going to require a lot of faith on our part. And Jesus said often, uh, even when we failed in faith, he healed people. But a lot of times he said, according to your faith, this will be done for you. And so I really like to encourage you. You know, Jesus said we can move mountains with our prayers. I haven't moved a physical mountain yet, but I've seen God do some pretty cool things. And it's a challenge to me to get praying more and to increase my faith. And faith is not faith in faith. Faith is not wishful thinking. Faith is being rooted on who Jesus says he is and letting that percolate deep into our heart so that the new wine can go into a new wine skin and that we can see the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Well, thank you for tuning in. I pray that you can uh, share this with someone else or at least learn this information so that you can share that with others and let the gospel that came to us go around the world and keep going and let the billions that don't know yet know. We're meeting on, we've started another in-person service on Wednesday evenings at seven o'clock. We encourage you to come. Uh, we encourage you to watch this, if you're not in a church on Sunday, to watch this one, because this is the same as Sunday, because uh, then we're going to do some Q&A. We're going to have some discussion on this. I'll give a little recap of this message on each Wednesday evening, but then we'll discuss things to which you learned during this, some insights that you might have to help teach the rest of us. If something popped into your head that you think would be useful, I'd love to hear it. So come on in. And, uh, and if there's something, a rabbit trail that, you know, you want to learn more about what was going on with John the Baptist at this particular time in history, um, then come on in and tell us what you have investigated that might help us to see this all a little more clear. I threw a lot of scripture at you today, and I'm sure there's somebody out there that can bring a few more highlight reels to what is deeper in this uh, message. But I gave you all those verses to show that major overarching theme that Jesus has come to rejoice with us and to set us free. God bless you. Have a great day. Let's do something together. Life is better in community. So let me encourage you to reach out to us via the connect card that you'll see in the description at the bottom of this video. That's your opportunity to just say hi. Let us know you're watching. Let us know how we can be praying for you. Or maybe you have some questions about faith, about our church, um, or about life in general. We're here to help you and we're happy to do so. I'd also like to thank those who are faithfully giving. I can't express my thanks enough. We're able to continue ministry in our community and abroad um, so wonderfully because of your faithfulness of giving the Lord's tithes and your offerings. So to go above and beyond his tithes is just incredible. And so for those of you who uh, want to come and visit us, please know that our service is a gift to you. We never ask for anything uh, as, from our guests. As a Christian, it is my act of worship to give to the Lord, and each one of us Christians uh, believe that. So if you want to come check us out, there's no pressure. Just come on over. Uh, if you did want to give, we have simple ways. Give at regalchurch.com for your e-transfer, no password required. You can drop it in the offering plate on Sundays, or you can drop through the to the office um, through the week. Just pop in, say hello and uh, let us know who you are and uh, we'd be happy to chat with you. Uh, we can also set up automatic deposit. We'll just send you the simple form and you fill it out and send it back and it's good to go. So thanks for your time and God bless you. Thank you.